All right. So say, that again. Do it with a little gusto. That again. How many times have you said that in your life? Oh, no, you got to be kidding. That again. Well, that's what we're going to look at today as we begin a new series in the book of Genesis called Heads or As we look at a new series called Heads or All right, listen, I'm not going to let you sleep on me. And so if you do, it's funny, last night <clears throat> we were in the JMSC, and uh, for whatever the reason, the, the air conditioner didn't come on when it was supposed to. So when we walked into the building, it was 75.7 degrees. That, that was that room, so it was warm. And then we added our largest crowd that we've had so far this summer on a Saturday night. There was only three seats left in the whole building. It was just, it was hot. So I told them, listen, if I do this, that means you're nodding out on me, and I'm going to keep you awake. So if you're not out on me this morning, I'm going to go. Come on, do it with me. You got it. My, my mentor, Dr. Gene Huber, he would do that. And I'd always wonder, why do you do that? Why do you clap your hands? And then when I started to preach, I realized why. Because he'd see somebody going. <laughs> By the way, do you know we have newlyweds with us today? Tim and Andrea Davis. Tim and Andrea, would you stand? They're newlyweds, just got back from their honeymoon. Congratulations. I'm gonna tell you right now, it just gets better. It doesn't always get easier, but it gets better. So today we begin this new series entitled Heads or Tails. And in so doing, we look at the shortest or the second shortest chapter in the book of Genesis. But may I say that although it may be the second shortest chapter in the book of Genesis, its message is powerful and one with lasting repercussions if we don't learn it quickly. And what is it that we need to learn quickly? Not that again. So our focus is in the form of a question. Two short words, that again. Now those words give us the choice when you think about it. That again. What's that mean? There's a choice. And what is the choice? We can choose heads or we can choose tails. We can choose to be the head or we can be, choose to be the tail. Because this chapter reveals to us that there are no plaster Paris of saints. It's called plaster of Paris saints. Now, we usually drop the of and just say plaster Paris saints. What does that mean? If you've ever seen a plaster of Paris statue, what happens is the artist removes all of the imperfections so that what you're looking at is as near perfect as any human artist can make it. For instance, the, here's a picture of St. Bridget. It's coming. Just a little slow. Hurry up. Now look at her. She is perfect. Her features are perfect. The coloring is perfect. Everything is perfect. So when we think of a saint, what do we think of? We think of a person who is as near perfect as possible. Is that not correct? Is that not correct? Yes, it is. So that's where the phrase comes, plaster of Paris saint. Because they're presented to us in perfection, not really as they truly are. You can't see any of the flaws. Now, speaking of saints, I thought I'd tell you, uh, read you a little story. It's the story of Mike and Sean O'Malley. They were the two richest men in their town, but they were complete shysters. Somebody just said amen to that. They swindled the church out of its property, foreclosed on the orphanage, and cheated widows out of their last mites. And that is just. For starters, one day, Sean suddenly died. 
Massive, massive heart attack. So Mike went to the local priest and demanded, Father, our family's good name will be upheld in this town. You will be given the eulogy for my brother. And in the eulogy, you are going to say, Sean O'Malley was a saint. I won't do such a thing, the priest responded. That would be a lie. <clears throat> you will, Mike said. I hold the mortgage on the parish school. If you don't say my brother Sean was a saint, then I will foreclose. Now the priest, not sure how to respond in fear, said, and if I promise to say those words, you'll sign the note over free and clear to the parish? Done, said Mike. And he signed the note right there in front of the priest, free and clear to the parish. So at the funeral, the priest gave the eulogy as agreed upon. And he said, Sean O'Malley was a mean-spirited, spiteful, penurious, lying, cheating, arrogant, and hateful excuse of a human being. Needless to say, the church became deathly quiet, faces were aghast, and the father continued. But compared to his brother, Sean O'Malley was a saint. <laughs> Heavenly Father, we are so grateful that we would never achieve a state of sainthood without your miraculous and marvelous and redeeming work on Calvary. Thank you for your pursuing, your persevering, and your perfecting love for us. And the church said, Amen. Amen. So we find our narrative in Genesis chapter 20. Last week, Bobby uh, covered chapter 19, and I'm going to reference that a few times in today's sermon because it's fitting. So chapter 20, verse 1. Now, Abraham moved on from there. Now, as we walk through this today, you're going to hear me use the word Abram and Sarai. You're also going to hear me refer to Abraham and Sarah as Abraham and Sarah. Now, why? Because you remember, God doesn't change their names till he's 99 and she's 89. To that point, it's Abram and Sarai. So if I say Abram, I'm referencing any time period pre 99 and 89. Does that make sense? All right, good, you're with me. Now, Abraham moved from there, which is Mamre, into the region of the Negev, and he lived between Kadesh and Shur. And for a while, he stayed in Gerar. And there, Abraham said of his wife, Sarah, she is my sister. Then Abimelech, king of Gerar sent for Sarah and he took her. So look at this. This king takes um, from the lips of infants I have ordained praise. So he takes Sarah from Abram and puts her in his harem. Now, some of you men are saying, if only. No man, man said amen. He's scared to death. His wife will let him have it. And some of your women are saying, if only. <laughs> your husbands weren't sitting next to you or you wouldn't have said that. So here's, let, let me show you the map. I'm going to show you what happens here. So. Um, in last week's sermon, chapter 19, Abram and his household are living in Mamre, which is just above Hebron, okay? Now he moves over here to Gerar. Now what's the name running somewhat northeast of Gerar? What is that? What's that say there? Philistines, 
or Philistines, however you want to pronounce it. So look at what he's doing. He's moving from where he was in Mamre, and he's going to a heathen culture. These are the same Philistines that, if you recall, Samson fought for 20 years, constantly at war with the Israelites. These same heathens who did not look at Jehovah as the one true God, but had other gods. This is where he moves. So put this in perspective now. Abram is 91 years old, and Sarah is 81 years old. Yet, at 81 years of age, say that with me, at 81 years of age, Sarah is still stunningly beautiful. She's physically a knockout. In fact, she's so beautiful that Abram tells a partial truth. He says, she is my sister. He doesn't say she is my wife, and she was his wife. He tells Sarah to do the same thing. Tell everyone that I am your brother and not your husband. Now, I'm thinking about this because the same thing happened in Genesis chapter 12, five years previously. Actually, six years previously. He does the same thing, tells the same lie about his wife. Now, it's a partial truth, but it's a lie about his wife because he doesn't say she is his wife. Why? Because she's this absolutely physically stunning, beautiful woman who at the age of 81, a king of a heathen nation is saying, I want that woman in my harem. So she's, she's pretty stunning. Are you seeing the picture? You know, and we think today, we've got this thing, everything is new, the Botox treatments, the facelifts, the wrinkle cream, the augmentations, and the like, that that's new. Listen, Sarah was tapping into that 2,900 years ago. She was. What did Solomon say? What's been done will be done again, and what's done now has already been done before. We think we got this new, all you ladies are going, look at this, man. I took every wrinkle out of my forehead. Eh, Sarah did that 2,900 years ago. She's like looking, wow. So the events that take place in this chapter, they raise three important questions. Actually, if you please, topics. The first is, why does Abraham tell a partial truth? Why does he lie about who his wife is? Secondly, the misconception that beauty rewarded by God is what a person looks like on the outside. And the third that we will look at this morning is how God develops character. So let's start with the first. Why does Abraham lie about Sarah being his wife? So let's move in this same chapter 20 and go to verse 9. Then Abimelech called Abraham in and he said, What have you done to us? How have I wronged you that you have brought such great guilt upon me and my kingdom? Now, what has happened here? Do we have somebody's phone going off, or is that happening in our sound system? Do you hear the beep? If we could, what is that? Oh, okay, we got it, no problem then. We'll live with it. <laughs> so, look at this picture for a moment. What happens is he takes Sarah to be his wife, puts her in the harem, and all of a sudden, they find out the women can't bear children. And then the men get some sort of physical um, ailment as well. So understand, this isn't one or two or three days. It's not like all of a sudden, this is this guy's wife. I mean, this is a long enough period that the, that the wives, the women, uh, the Philistine women are not bearing children. So she's in this harem for a while. And then all of a sudden, he's not too happy. So he goes to Abraham, back to the scripture, Danny, and he says, you wronged us. You brought guilt upon me and my kingdom. Are you seeing this? A heathen is rebuking a believer. 
And if you remember Bobby's, test, Bobby's story last night when she was on the campus and kind of just living so-so and not where she was, should have been for the Lord. And some lady, one of the, uh, her peers called her out on it. And she said, that's when I looked in the mirror and said, I better get my Christian walk together. Well, that's kind of what's happening here. You have done things to me that should never be done. And by the way, I shouldn't just say, Bobby, we've all been there. We're, you know, a, a heathen, so to speak, called us out and embarrassed us. And Abimelech asked Abraham, what was your reason for doing this? So Abram replied, I said to myself, there is surely no fear of God in this place, and they will kill me because of my wife. Besides, <laughs> I love this, besides, just, just mark that word, she really is my sister, the daughter of my father, though not of my mother. I know, West Virginia existed back in those days. And when God had me wander from my father's household, I said to her, this is how you can show your love to whom? Who's the me? Who's the me? Come on. It's Abraham. This is how you can say you love me. Men do that all the time, the creeps that they are. If you really loved me. If you really loved me. How long have they been married? Listen, if you really love me, then you say, I am your brother. And everywhere we go, say, he is your brother. Now, this should make you feel good about yourself. Remember, there are no plaster of Paris saints. Look at this man. He is the father of our faith. Say that. He is the father of our faith. And what's he doing? Shifting blame. He shifts blame because of the lie. He shifts blame when guilt comes upon this kingdom. How does he do it? The first thing he does is he says, oh, we're going to the land of the Philistines. They have no fear of God. And then his second blame is, it's Sarah's fault. She's just too pretty. Never once does Abraham say, come on, it's my fault. Say it with me. It's my fault. You're too weak. No, listen, that's got to make you feel good about yourself. Because you know what? We stumble. And look how long he's been a believer when God called him out. And here he is still blowing it. So here's the reality of it. Abraham lies about Sarah being his wife because he's concerned about his own hide. That's the bottom line. He is selfish. Now, ladies, just put your finger in your ears for a moment because I'm going to talk to the men. Come on, ladies, put your fingers in your ear. I'm going to talk to the men. Ladies, Lori, put your finger in your ear. Now, I know you're all going to cheat, ladies, and you're going to pull your fingers out of your ears. We can be so insensitive at times, guys. We can. We, we really are. You recall a lot last week's sermon. You remember what he did when the men wanted to have sex with the two angels? Recall what he said? He said, oh, don't do that. God forbid. I've got two virgin daughters in my household. How about I give them to you? What was he doing? He was protecting his own hide. What's Abraham doing here? Protecting his own hide. You know what's really interesting here, Bob? Is that these two men are considered righteous in the book of Hebrews chapter 11, and they blow it. They're supposed to be the protectors of their home, providers and priests. And he's supposed to be protecting his household, and Lot says, here's my two daughters. And Abraham's supposed to be protecting his household, and what does he say? Oh, listen, just, just, just uh, say you're, I'm your brother. It's all right if he takes you, as long as he doesn't take me. That's the reality of life. Both these men, we consider saints, but they're not plaster of Paris saints. They had their flaws, just like 
you and I have our flaws. Secondly, it reveals, read it with me, a lapse, come on, in faith, trusting El Shaddai to be his protector. What he does here is he trusts the lie rather than his God. He thinks that I'll just say she is my sister and that'll protect me rather than realizing that God was his protector. Listen, he took 318 men and beat five kingdoms. How quickly we forget that God is indeed our protector. How quickly the Israelites would forget that God delivered them out of Egypt, that he divided the Red Sea, that he gave them water from the rock, that he brought manna down from heaven, and he defeated nations three and four times their size. How quickly they forgot. How quickly the disciples forgot that Jesus took loaves and fish and he multiplied them and fed thousands of people. How quickly we forget. Say that with me. How quickly we forget that God is El Shaddai. We forget that God saw us through yesterday's trial when today's tribulation smacks us afresh in the face. And that's the reality. I love this quote by Winston Churchill. If you're going through hell... If you're going through hell, if you're going through hell, yes, I posted this on my social media and I added the verse in Matthew that says, he that endures to the end shall be saved. And then someone posted, if he brought you to it, he'll see you through it. And then I posted, if you brought yourself to it, <laughs> here's the miracle. If you brought yourself to it, come on, read it with me and are willing to give God the mess, he'll also see you through it. And that's what God did for Lot. That's what God does for Abram. He carried them through their hell, and he'll do the same for you if, come on, finish it, you will let him. Now hear me. If you hold on to your trial, if you hold on to your temptation, if you hold on to your testing, he doesn't have it. As long as you're holding on to it, he doesn't have it. But if you're willing to let it go, he's got it. Step back and watch what he'll do with it. It will absolutely amaze you because that's the nature of our God. After this second rebuke, Abraham, we have no record that he again lies about his wife. Now maybe she's just getting too old. And No, I'm only kidding. So I would be remiss this morning if I don't address this subject because it permeates our media, it permeates Hollywood. It just, you know, it infiltrates every phase in which we live. And that's physical beauty. Although God recognizes physical beauty, for instance, Sarah, Rachel, Job's daughters, Tamar, Esther, and then we could go to the men's side of things. God recognizes men that are handsome. Eliab, Saul, King Saul, Absalom. Although he recognizes physical beauty, he doesn't reward it. Recall, man looks at the outward appearance. God looks at the heart. So, young ladies and young men, I want to talk to you just for a moment. Now, you should do your best to keep in shape. Because if you don't, you may never get married. Who wants somebody that's out of shape and just, you know... I'm sorry, but when you're that age, things kind of, you know, you're, there's a certain attraction that, you, you know, and ultimately, I don't know that that walks down the aisle, but it certainly helps in its initial connection. And you should be in shape. It's a good thing to do. You know what I mean? So you, you should be in shape. But with that said, it's not what God rewards. 
He rewards character. And what is character? It's who we are when no one is looking. It's who we are when the crowds want you to go one way and God's asking you to go another way. So just hear me out for a moment. Why do we go the way of the crowd? Why do we go the way of the crowd? Because it's the easy way. We want to fit in. We want to be cool. Better to be not so cool here and to be cool in eternity than to be cool here and hot in eternity. Did you get that? Recall something. When God, when God commented on Sarah's beauty in 1 Peter chapter 3, he makes absolutely no reference to what she looked like physically. But he does address her beauty. So let's stand. I'd like us to read it together. Take a deep breath. Get some oxygen in your lungs so I don't have to go. Keep you awake. So ladies... <clears throat> Your beauty should not come from outward adornment, such as elaborate hairstyles and the wearing of gold jewelry or fine clothes. Rather, it should be that of your inner self, the unfading beauty, read this with me, of a gentle and quiet spirit. Just stay on the screen for a moment, Danny. Now, I think we can misinterpret this. He doesn't say, that we can fix ourselves up. As the late Dr. Jerry Falwell would say, if the barn needs painting, paint it. If you didn't get that, there's another train coming. But he's not saying that we can't fix up. He's saying, as believers, we need to realize that our real beauty doesn't lie in what we wear, our accessories, our real beauty is in who we are here. Now, if you go to Amish country, country, what do you see? You see women who do not braid their hair, do not wear gold, wear the plainest attire as possible. Why do they do that? They believe they are fulfilling this scripture verse. I'm not sure that's what it means. I don't think that's what it means. I think he's saying is that if you feel like, you know, your beauty's fading and that's what, you know, that's what Solomon says, that, that charm is deceptive and beauty is fading, but a lady who loves the Lord shall be praised. When we realize that who we are is what God's going to reward, then we've got it in the right order. If you're drawing your self-worth by what you look like or what you're wearing today or whatever, can I say to you, you've missed the heart of God. It's really quiet. So just say amen so I know you're listening. Amen. All right, thank you. I mean, what we've just read here is totally contrary to what you're bombarded with every day. You know, it cracks me up. You see these 19-year-old you know, girls on TV and they're advertising wrinkle cream. Are you serious? When you're 69, then advertise wrinkle cream. I want to see if it works. You know what I mean? So here we go, continuing. Spent a little more time on that than I should have, but you get the point. Which is of what? Great worth in God's sight. It's interesting, isn't it? The world makes heroes out of the women who don't have quiet spirits. Just the opposite of what God's going to reward. For this is the way the holy women of the past who put their hope in God used to adorn themselves. So as beautiful as Sarah was, this is what made her beautiful in the eyes of God. And the church said, all right, you may be seated. So let's recap what we've addressed to date or today. Why did Abraham tell once again a partial lie? Because he was selfish. He was protecting his own hide instead of his wife's. And there's a lesson to learn here. Selfishness will always come back and bite you. Say that with me. Selfishness will always come back and bite you. But selflessness is like the sun. It casts its power to energize, whether seen or not. 
Number two. Although beauty is acknowledged by God and often rewarded by man, the world, Hollywood, and advertising bears that out, it's not what God rewards. God sees and rewards the hidden beauty of the heart. Therefore, as we journey through life, we can live life for the accolades of man or the eternal acknowledgement of our Savior. That's the choice we have. And then third and last is how God develops character. Now, in brief, here's the setting. I've given it to you. Abraham moves to Gerar, the land of the Philistines. His wife is taken into the harem of King Abimelech. Abimelech has a dream, and God reveals to him that he has the wife of a prophet. So instead of shifting blame, although he clearly rebukes Abraham for what he did, he puts together a gift and he takes it to the prophet. Now, why does he do this? It's not shifting blame. In a sense, I would say, I don't have to take the prophet anything. He screwed me over. I'm not the one who screwed him over. Because all throughout the Old Testament, you weren't to approach a man of God without a gift. If you recollect, when uh, King Saul and his friend wanted to approach Samuel, Saul said to his friend, how can we approach the prophet without a gift? I have nothing to give him. It was understandable, whether it was Elijah or Elisha, whoever it was, you didn't approach a man of God without a gift. It was, in a sense, an act of humility because that man of God, in a sense, was your connection and held in his hand your future. So look at what Abimelech does. So Abimelech brought sheep and cattle and male and female slaves and gave them to Abraham. Now, you know, we slaves has, a, has today a, a, a strongly negative connotation. So we could put the word servants here, but that's what he's doing. He brings them servants to Abraham. And I guarantee you, Abraham treated them as though they were one of his household because he was a man of God. And he returned Sarah, his wife, to him. And Abimelech said, my land is before you. Live wherever you like. Look at this. Here's a man that does him wrong. And as a heathen, what does he do? He does right. Listen, whatever you want, this land is is you is yours now the beauty of this story is God's pursuing persevering and perfecting love refusing to give up on us until his character is formed in us he refused to give up on Abraham refused to give up on Lot until his character was formed in him so whenever you have to ask yourself that again Let's say it, shall we? That again. Maybe we're missing that God is trying to do something in us that he hasn't been able to do. And that's why we keep having to see this thing over and over and over and over again. See, God wanted Abram to trust him, to believe that he was his protector, not the lie. We talked about when a lie was a good lie and when it was a bad lie. Remember that? The whole sermon was built around it. And what we said was, if indeed it appears that God honors the lie, in every case, it was a lie of faith. Rahab protecting the spies. And let's put it in modern day language. Look at Brother Andrew, who smuggled Bibles into communist countries. His lie was, in a sense, an act of faith. Look at those who hid Jews from the Nazis. Their lie was an act of faith. So it appears that God honors the act of faith when it's in his will, but he won't honor a lie of fear. And Abraham's lie was a lie of fear to protect his own hide. Number two, if we keep facing the same thing over and over again, maybe, just maybe, there's a character weakness in us that God is trying to strengthen. So I keep a little journal because it tells me where I am with God. And it looks something like this. 
I uh, posted it along with the sermon title this week. So every day I have divine appointments, and I write in my divine appointments for that day. Now I crossed out the names. This one was at Charlie Brown's. It was the funniest thing. I posted this, and nobody ever saw the divine appointments. They all said, oh, you did 60 push-ups or whatever. That's not why that's up there. That's just for me. You know, today's luncheon, God spoke, walk in obedience, put away all sin, let me bless. And these are my own little daily spiritual walk with God. And there's all kinds of little symbols in here. There's hills, there's hills with crosses, there's letters, J-B-P-L-A-W, all those things tell me something about my walk with the Lord in that day. They tell me if there were victories or if there were defeats. And sometime I'll look over a week and I'll go, whoo, Sophia, you had a rough week. Look at all those defeats. And other weeks I'll look over and I'll go, wow, that's pretty good. You had a good week. And if I don't have any divine appointments, it just rips me up because it means somehow I was not in tune with what God wanted to be in tune with. So let me ask you a question. What character trait is the Holy Spirit trying to put into your life? Is it sharing the gospel? Let, let me make a suggestion on sharing the gospel. There's a great way to do that. It's non-condemning. It's not embarrassing. Nobody can reject it. Just say, what do you think of Jesus? Just say to somebody out of the blue, so what do you think of Jesus? How are they going to respond? You don't know. So the Holy Spirit's got it. They're liable to say, oh, I don't think about Jesus. It doesn't mean anything to me. I don't think he exists. It ends there. It's not a rejection. You gave them a question they're going to respond to. Is it living out pots, P-O-T-S? I'm going to illustrate. So the church has been using um, an outside electrical contractor for years, does superb work. And uh, about 10 years ago, there was a young man that they hired, a brilliant young man. And whenever I would try to address the subject of God or Jesus or salvation, you know, um, he would just, oh, you know, that's what you believe. I know what I believe, just we won't discuss it. So we would never discuss religious things. So the last couple years, we've been able to talk about things, but I never talked about religious things. And the other day, he's working, and I got involved, and we're, we're just talking to one another, and he's, he's sort of going through his life scenario, which has turned kind of ugly, um, just not his fault, just the way things have turned. And as we're talking about it, I could certainly relate, because, you know, I've experienced that in my own family. And the Lord said to me, pots, P-O-T-S. Pots. I'm saying, you got to be kidding. I'm not going to pray with this guy. He's just going to say, no, nah, pray to yourself. And I heard it again, pots. And I just kept saying, that's not God. So I walked down the hall and I went in my room and that little voice came back to me and said, Bruce, pots. So I said, all right, here you go. I'll show you God. <laughs> And I went and I said to him, Mr. A, would it be all right if I prayed with you? And without hesitation, he said, sure. And for the next minute or two, we prayed. And I prayed for his situation. When you hear that little voice inside of your gut, can I tell you that more often than not, it's him. It's his way of building who he is inside of you. So is it sharing the gospel? Is it pots when he says to you, pray with somebody? Is it finances? Listen, as a Christian, you'll keep facing financial difficulties unless you put the tithe in your life. When you put that in your life, then you've got it where God wants it. Trust him. Is it a personality trait that just irritates you? And every time you get a job, there's that same, as my dad would say, stinking personality right next to you that you got to deal with. 
Well, maybe God's trying to put something of him in you because God loves him just like he loves you. You know, we go, oh, there's a sinner. God says, no, there's a sinner who Jesus died for. What a difference. Is it saying no to a sin that God wants you to have victory over? Or is it saying yes to something that he wants you to do? But the sooner you say yes to what God's perfecting love is asking, the more satisfying your life will become. Let me give it to you one more time. The sooner you say yes to God's perfecting love, the more satisfying your life will become. And the church said, let's stand, shall we? Those of you who can, if you can't, that's okay. Just you can stay seated. So where does that begin? Where does that relationship of knowing God, allowing him to perfect you into the person he desires you to be, where does that begin? In a relationship with him, how do we do that? We admit that our sin separates us from God. We believe the truth about God, that he does something about it in the person of Jesus. We commit our life to him. And D, there's a day we do it. Have you given your life to Christ? Have you given your life to Christ? If not, why not today? Why not this moment so he can begin to build you into the person that he stamped you to be with promise, potential, value, and purpose? Could we close our eyes and pray a prayer something like this? Just say, Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. Go ahead, just say that in your heart. Father in heaven, thank you for loving me. I admit to you that I've done things that are wrong and you've called those things sin. Be merciful to me, a sinner. I am sorry. Jesus, on this day, I turn my life over to you. I give you my life. Be my Lord and Savior. 